I want to first of all thank all of you for taking the time to come on the, the, the day of the first night of Hanukkah. I appreciate you venturing outside. I think that it'll be well worth your effort. Um, we are very lucky today to have a wonderful speaker from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Diana Fumato, <clears throat> who is the chief of the ITS research branch at the Holocaust Survivors and Victims Resource Center. ITS, as you will hear, stands for the International Tracing Service, and it's a remarkable resource that exists at the US Holocaust Museum that, as we mentioned last time, can help trace the, the movement and the experiences and therefore the life of survivors and victims of the Holocaust through the documentation that was assembled originally in Bad Arlson, Germany, and now exists in copies at US Holocaust Museum, and I believe at Yad Vashem as well, they have a copy. Um, but US Holocaust Museum not only has these amazing resources, but they also perform as a service to the families of survivors and victims that they will search those archives on your behalf and will email you or send to you the results of their research, meaning all the documents um, for a given person. And we here at the center were able to use their generosity uh, in that program a few months ago in the summer when we um, received a donation of a jacket from a concentration camp prisoner in Dachau. And we had the number on the coat, and we did a little initial research and were able to find his name, his mother's name, and um, the museum sent us probably 60 to 75 documents for both him and his mother, showing um, when they'd applied for a ration card and which transports they were on and so on and so forth. It's really a remarkable resource um, that uh, can allow us to try to piece together a life in the absence of any um, oral record or video record. So um, it's very exciting. I have a few more names I'm going to be submitting for other family members, but uh, I really look forward to the lecture. And as you know, who, anyone who receives our catalog, this is our last event for the fall semester. It feels like just a few minutes ago we were opening up the first one. But it's been a really wonderful semester, and I appreciate you all for coming out to support it. This is also the last lecture of this semester for the Drs. Owen and Bibi Bernstein lecture series. And we thank Bibi for her generosity and her support throughout the years. I also want to thank everyone here that's a member and a supporter of the center. It's with the support of our community that we're able to offer programming like this. I also want to say that we have a really wonderful schedule of events coming for the spring. It's about to go to print probably next week, so they should be in mailboxes um, around the first of the year. Um, if you don't get a copy, they should be on our website around the same time, and you can always call over here to get a copy. Uh, we have our new rotating exhibit coming February 10th. It's on Hollywood and the Holocaust. It's called Producing Silence, because that's most of what Hollywood produced for the first few years of the rise of the Nazi party. Um, and there's going to be some excellent programming and lectures around that new exhibit. So without uh, further ado, I'd like to welcome to the mic and to introduce you to Dr. Diana Fumato. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Dan, for uh, the beautiful introduction, and also it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I've never been here, so I had a privilege to um, have a tour um, of the center, and I, I have to say I'm very impressed uh, with all the, the documents that you have, the books, and the exhibitions that you, um, you've organized. So, um, so thank you very much. And, um, so Dan told you a little bit about the um, International Tracing Service collection that we have at the museum. And I'm going to try to summarize what the collection is. Um, and um, just to give you a sense of the scope of the, uh, the collection, it's about 185 million pages uh, of documentation. So don't worry, I'm not going to give you a lot of numbers uh, because not, I'm, I'm not good at numbers, but um, I, it's just to give you an idea of the scope of it. Um, what I'm going to do is to try to tell you and to talk to you about how we use the, the, the collection um, to help people. 
So let's get started with a very brief history about um, the collection in Bad Erlson. So first of all, the collection, um, the original material remains in Bad Erlson in Germany. So what we have at the museum is a digital copy of it. Um, and Bad Erlson um, got the um, original material uh, right after the war, very, um, very soon after the war. And it was mostly um, uh, compiled by the Allies. So all what the Allies you know, found in uh, liberating the camps uh, was gathered in Bad Erlson. And until December 2008, um, that, though, you know, those documents were not accessible at all. Uh, so it was basically closed to the public and uh, thanks to the effort of the, uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, um, the uh, collection was finally open to the public, and um, and now it's um, it's on the process uh, in the process of being completely digitized, and we have a digitized copy. So this is where Bad Aronson is in Germany, and this is basically um, what the collection is. And I'm going to try to explain about the content to explain to you what the content is. This is just a plaque uh, in Bad Aronson in Germany, and. Um, it's at the entrance of the main building. This is the, the main building in Bad Erosun. Bad Erosun is really a tiny place, a tiny village. Uh, not village, a little town, I should say. Um, it's about two and a half hours from Frankfurt, uh, a mine. And um, so this is the main building where the archives are, but there are some other buildings because it's so huge, you can imagine that you know, it doesn't uh, stay in only one building. It's too huge. Um, on the left-hand side, what you see is just one room where the archives are. Uh, there are multiple rooms like this one. Um, some others have um, uh, shelves full of boxes, uh, full of cards, full of documentation, full of documents piled up like this. And so this is what ITS looks, looks like in Bad Erosen in Germany. On the right-hand side of the slide, this is what ITS looks like at the museum. So this is completely too, I mean, this is totally different. When we do research with the original material, you can go to the shelf, you know, pull out the box and open the box and just sort it out. Um, when you look at the computer, it's a different research. So it's a little bit more complicated to, um, to get access to the documents and it's a different way of searching, but we still search, you know, somehow the same way. This is, um, oh, it's going too fast, okay. Um, so this is, um, roughly what we call the national representation of the ITS. You probably, I mean, for some of you who heard about the ITS collection, you probably heard that ITS is quite rich in terms of documentation for the Jews who were in the western part of Europe. But the more you go east, the less you have about the ITS. Well, what I don't like about ITS is generalizations. I don't like, you know, general information because it's true and not true. So let's say that when I speak about the ITS and when I speak about the Jews in the ITS and the Holocaust, I usually say that ITS reflects what the Holocaust was. So for the Jews who were deported from one country to another one, of course, you know, there were a transport list. There were some, there was some organization behind this in order to transport a certain number of people to a camp. When the Jews were murdered on location in the East, for example, uh, there was no trace of that because they, you know, there was no transport required, there was no organization, so they, there was no list of people who were murdered on location. I'm talking about Ukraine, for example. So roughly, this is what ITS um, reflects. And um, so when, when we hear that ITS is very rich in terms of documentations about the Jews in the West, but not so much in the East, it's true and not true. Because a lot, of, as you know, a lot of Jews from the East, and especially from Poland, um, went to Western Europe um, at the end of the 1930s, and especially between the two war period. Uh, so you find some of those in the transport list. For example, people who were coming from Poland in, in, at the end of the 1930s, and they ended up in Holland or France or Belgium, and they were deported when the war started in 1939, you, um, you can find their names on transport list from those countries back to Poland. So that's why I don't like generalizations, because you find them somehow for some of them. I said I wouldn't tell you too many uh, numbers, but I'm gonna give you some, just to give you an idea of the work that we do with my staff. 
Um, so far, what, uh, since the opening of the ITS at the Holocaust Museum at the end of 2007, December 2007, uh, we have received almost 23,000 individual requests. So it means, like Dan mentioned before, um, you would contact the museum, you would fill out the form. By the way, I brought some forms for you, so if you have any questions and if you want to do research, uh, you can ask me at the end and, and, and I can explain that to you. But people would go online or would fill out the form, the printed form, uh, with the information that you know, and you would send that to us, and we would do the research for you, and we would send you whatever we find in the ITS if we find anything. Um, so, so far we have received almost 23,000 requests about individuals. Um, those requests are mostly from Jewish families, from survivors themselves, some, some of them seeking compensation, uh, and, um, and also from people who are not Jewish and who were persecuted because the ITS is not only about the Holocaust and the Jews, it's about all the victim groups, as you will see later. Um, most of the requests that we receive come from the United States, but also from uh, 75 countries, including countries that have a copy of the ITS, uh, because people don't know sometimes that, you know, for, for example, you mentioned Yad Vashem. Um, it's true that Yad Vashem has a copy of the ITS collection, but we receive a, a lot of requests from Israel. We also receive a lot of requests from Germany when Bad Arelson, you know, has the, not only a copy, but also the original material. And, um, there is an impressive uh, number here. It's the largest number of documents that we sent for one case, only one case. It's 658 documents. Uh, I don't want to raise your expectation. That was exceptional, really exceptional. Um, but when we find something, uh, for some cases, we don't find anything depending on what happened to the person. But when we find something, it could be you know, five documents, 15 documents, 60 documents, 80 documents are not unusual. Uh, 650, uh, 58, this is absolutely amazing. And it, you can imagine it took several days to find those documents. So the ITS at the museum is, um, you can, if you want to search the ITS, if you want to do it yourself, do the research yourself, you can, you're welcome to come to the museum. Uh, you will be helped by one of my staff. Uh, you need to be helped because ITS is um, very difficult to search. Uh, I assume that you all know how to use Google in this room. Uh, ITS is the opposite of Google. You don't Google the ITS. There is absolutely no way. So um, it's quite difficult to search, so you will need help. Uh, but if you come to the museum, you're going to be helped. And if you come, make sure that you bring a flash drive with you because if you find some materials, uh, you can copy everything on your flash drive and leave the museum with everything. It's a completely free access and, um, and you don't have to pay for anything. And it's um, completely open to the public. So there is no restriction whatsoever. If you want uh, to copy a lot of material, it's just a question of time, how much time you have. So what does ITS contain? Um, this is really, really basic, but ITS is divided into uh, different sub-collections and many, many sub, sub, sub collections. Um, roughly, ITS contains a lot of documents about all sorts of camps, internment camps, concentration camps, uh, forced labor camps, dead, and to some extent, um, some death camps, some, oops, some killing centers, but not that many. And we do have some information about some ghettos, but ITS doesn't have much about ghettos. However, we do have a lot of um, information about, other, uh, about ghettos in the other collections at the museum. ITS is very, very um, interesting in terms of post-war material. This is completely new to the public and to the researchers. Um, we have lots of documentation about DP camps, displaced persons camps. Um, and we have uh, a lot of information about repatriation and immigration after the war, mostly from those DP camps um, in Europe. And as I said before, ITS is really about all the persecutions or, um, by the Nazis and their collaborators, so all the victim groups are in the ITS. So let me give you some examples of documents that we have in the ITS. There is a separate, um, there are actually several separate collections, sub-collections um, about children in the ITS because um, back to the late 1940s and the beginning of the 1950s when the ITS in Bad Erosen was uh, tracing people, they had a separate um, child tracing service. Um, and so those pictures come from one of the sub-collections of um, the ITS. 
So every time we're looking for someone who was a children back then, we search the general uh, central name index, but also those specific files for children because they might be there only. Um, this is a post-war document that we call the CM1 that stands for Care and Maintenance. Uh, this is just the name of the form that uh, people filled out when they were in a DP camp. When people were in DP camps, and especially Jews who didn't want to be repatriated um, because they didn't have any reason to go back to their own country or because they, they lost their family, so they wanted to emigrate somewhere, they needed to ask for help and in order to get the refugee status. So uh, it was basically the whole application here. And what is interesting is, um, is that that form is um, filled out by the head of the family, the head of the household. And you have so much information about the whole family. You have the, not only the names of the people, but their dates of birth and places of birth. Also, um, you have photographs on those forms. And we have a lot of sub-collections with photographs on it. So sometimes um, it can be the last photograph taken. And you know the, sometimes the family doesn't even have that photograph. Um, so we make sure that when we send those documents to the families, we. Uh, we make sure that we mention the photograph and we describe that in a very sensitive way uh, so that the person who receives the document by email you know, is not completely shocked to open and to see the photograph. And um, so those uh, applications were very rich in, in terms of information and sometimes it contained the last 10 or 12 years of employment. Uh, the, um, also the, uh, the languages that the family spoke, uh, the education, so it's really a lot of information, but what is interesting, it also contains something about immigration. There's always a question asking the person, would you like to go back to your own country? Most of the Jews who filled out those forms said no. So the second question was, where would you like to go? And you have the, what we call the desired immigration. It doesn't mean that it, it, they ended up in that country, but you can imagine that for most of them, I mean, they asked, for Palestine or Israel after 1948, or the United States and Canada for uh, most of them. But some of them would also stay, uh, say Argentina, for example, because they had someone in Argentina already who could help. Um, and so that's interesting in terms of post-war immigration. So if you are interested in this type of research, or if you know someone, or if you uh, have family who immigrated to any of those countries, they might be in the ITS collection. So this is, uh, for example, the last places of residence and employment. And it goes back to 1936 for this one. In uh, those sub-collections, in that particular collection, we also have a lot of information about immigration and uh, a lot of correspondence sometimes. On the uh, left-hand side, this letter um, is about re-establishing a date of birth. Most people who lost, I mean, who ended up in DP camps had no documentation whatsoever. They had no ID, they had absolutely no papers proving their date of birth, their you know, identity. And some of them had to lie to survive in some camps. So um, this is you know, a letter about re-establishing the date of birth. You know, how to find, to, to make sure that you can get uh, you can prove that you were born on a particular date and a place. Um, and the, uh, the right, on the right-hand side of the, uh, the slide, um, this is a rejection on medical grounds uh, for immigration. That person was actually rejected. Uh, she could not enter the United States because she had tuberculosis. Um, we don't know the end of the story. As you can imagine, this is you know, archival, an archival collection, so it means that by definition it's not complete. Um, so we don't know if she applied again, uh, so we don't know the end of the story. So if you want to know what happened to her, you would need to complete the ITS collection with other um, archival collections. This is um, an ID card um, issued in a DP camp. And um, so when, actually there's a story behind it that I would like to share with you. Um, one of my staff came, one, it was one day, uh, sort of late um, in, in the day, and she was really moved by you know, the, the research that she has done. And, um, and she, she said, well, you know, I, I have to tell you something, and she shared with me the whole story behind that ID card. So this gentleman, uh, you can see his picture, he looks very handsome. Um, I mean, sorry to be so uh, 
uh, open, but you know, he looks very handsome on that picture. But there were some other documents making some comments about his haircut that was too long. I mean, his hair were, uh, was too long, and so he couldn't find a job. So those letters um, were written by social workers helping you know, um, the DPs, and uh, so there was a correspondence back and forth saying, well, you know, he can't find a job with that haircut and blah, blah, blah. And so my staff was very, you know, upset about the whole thing because she said it, but, you know, they were supposed to help people not to make some comments like this. And I said, well, yes, and, but hold on, you know, calm down because they, also, they are also trying to help. Uh, they were not making you know, bad comments or mean comments at all. They were trying to figure out why he couldn't find a job. And maybe the haircut was one of the reasons. I mean, you know, by today's standards, you know, he doesn't have long hair, but by the 1940s and 1950s, well, he has sort of long hair. So they were trying to, to help somehow, and bear in mind that those social workers didn't really have much um, training. Uh, you know, there was no, no training back then in the 1940s and 1950s to help people. So they did the best they could, but you know, it's, it's really hard sometimes when you read those comments, um, especially so many years after the facts, and we know what happened to those people. But back then, they were just doing the best they could. This is a ship manifest of uh, people who um, emigrated from uh, Austria to Argentina, uh, and they started, I mean, they, they left uh, from France, from Marseille in, France, in the south of France after the Second World War. Um, we have a lot of ship manifests, so we have a lot of uh, information about people who emigrated after the war. So let me show you how we do research now. Um, so this is just a, a, a screenshot um, of the form that you have uh, on the table back there. And uh, so if you open a request with us, the, the minimum that we would need is a, a, a name, a complete name, a date of birth and a place of birth. Without this, we can't start researching the ITS because we start with this, what we call the central name index, which has more than 17 million people there. If you're looking for a very common name, there is absolutely no way we can find that person. We can identify the right card. Um, so we need something in addition to the name and, and you know, so here, um, I'm saying this, but I also contradict myself because here we have Leon Glatter, the name, the full name, um, the place of birth, but we have an approximate date of birth. So even a, an approximate date of birth can help. Um, we have many, many requests from the second generation and the third generation and the fourth generation, and they, for most of them, especially the third generation and the fourth, they don't know much about what happened during the war. So you know, we have requests saying my great grandfather was born in Russia, and um, but I don't know when. So we have to go back to them and say, okay, well, he was your great grandfather. So what were when was your grandfather born? When was your father born? When was, so we try to narrow it down in order to get at least an approximate date of birth. Something, even something like uh, the 1890s would help. So in this case, what helped was that we had his parents' names. And thanks to this, uh, we were able to find um, some documents that you will see uh, in a minute. So what we do in our, uh, this is very technical, but I'm not going to, to be too technical, but it's just to show you the process uh, that we follow. And so we capture every single sub-collection that we search. Uh, so we know exactly step by step what we did, what we didn't do, what, you know, what remains, and what we found. Uh, so this is the, what we call the note field, the internal notes, and this is where we capture all those uh, references. Just to give you a sense of the complexity of the ITS, you know, what you see here is not clear to anyone in this room. Um, OCC2 slash two something. This is just the name of the, the reference of the sub collection. So this is just to give you an idea of the complexity of the ITS. And even saying this, it doesn't give you a sense of it, but uh, we understand what it means. So starting with a name and an approximate date of birth and a place of birth, we found 19 cards. Those cards point to a document. Just to give you uh, an idea, when you look at, can you hear me okay? Uh, when you look at this card, for example, you have the name of the person, the prisoner number in Buchenwald here, and this is the reference that we need to enter in the database, and then we can find the document here. This is not a, the document itself. This is just a card. So imagine when 
Um, imagine when you, um, when you go to a library, for example, and you have the name of the writer and you have the title of the book. You go to the manual file, or today you go to the computer, uh, and it will give you a reference number or at least a location on the shelf. So this is the same thing. It's not the book itself. It's not the document itself. It's just a card that points to the document. From those cards, this is what we sent to the person. We found 133 pages of documentation. Um, it's not 133 documents about him, but it's something related to him. Because what we do, every time we, we find like a, a list of deportation, for example, we also send the first page of the list so it, the person who opens the email understands the, understands the source of it. ITS is in 27 different languages. There is no way that we can translate all the documents, not because we don't have the resources in-house. We do have people who basically, you know, we can find someone who speaks something uh, and who is able to translate something. This is not a big deal, but we don't have time to do it. And it's not worth it because what we send are mostly lists or, you know, you don't have to translate anything. So what we do, we describe the document as much as we can so the person who opens the email would understand the nature of the document. By attaching the first page, you know, we go back to the source. So let's say that the list was dated in 1942, you, we would describe this. So with the first page and the list, and pointing to the name on the list, we would say your grandfather's name was uh, you know, the 31st on this list. We would just point the person to the uh, information that is interesting. So this is um, an example of the, the 133 documents that we found for him. So this is the Buchenwald envelope with, on um, the top right of the slide, it's the, um, um, the number of the tracing, it's called TD, it's tracing and documentation, which is a file um, showing that there was a previous inquiry sent to Bad Arrowson. In this file, you have all the correspondence between the requester back then, and Bad Aronson. So it's the result of the previous research. But what is interesting here is that um, there are six documents in that envelope, and, um, and also the prisoner number that you can see, 116261, that's his prisoner number in Buchenwald. That's the, uh, to, uh, you know, steal about him, uh, that's his um, Buchenwald form. Uh, so you have basic information here, and we will describe what it is, and we will explain what those documents are. Uh, it's just to give you an idea of the nature of the documents that we can find in the ITS. Another um, prisoner card that we find, um, as you can see, he was uh, considered as Jewish, um, and uh, we have you know, his date of birth, place of birth. So this is just basic information, but that's his original uh, prisoner card in Buchenwald. And uh, those are two um, examples of what, re what is in the uh, tracing and documentation in the previous inquiry sent to Bad Aronson. So on the right-hand side, this is the form that Bad Aronson used to send to people. So instead of um, describing all the documents, they would send a form summarizing the whole research that they, they, uh, they've done for you. And, um, so in this file, you have a lot of correspondence back and forth between the requesters, uh, let's say in the 1950s, 1960s, up to today, uh, and the result of the research. When we have this, uh, we send everything, uh, and we also redo the complete research, because back then, Bad Aerosen, for privacy reason, could not send most of the documents. Uh, because, uh, as you know, most of the privacy laws in Europe are very strict compared to the United States. Um, and so, Anything that was a list of names, for example, could not be sent to anybody because there were several names on that list. Um, any document that was an individual document, like the prisoner card, that was just about Leo, Leo, uh, Leon Glatter. So they could send a, an individual document, but when there were uh, several names on the list, they couldn't send that. Um, so today, uh, they, they can, actually. And, um, and also, here we send, again, everything that we have because the ITS um, copy falls under the privacy law of the country that is the um, national recipient. So in the US, there is no such thing as privacy laws as strict as in Europe. Um, so what we do when we send those documents to uh, the person who inquired, 
we somehow we construct the path, what we call the path of persecution. So we attach chronologically all the documents that we found, um, and we describe them the, the, the best we can. And, um, and also, we try to put them in the historical context. What we don't do is fill the gaps. We don't assume that the person, if we don't have any information between 1942 and 1943, for example, we wouldn't say, we assume that your grandfather was blah, blah, blah. We can't do this because we stick to you know, the documents that we have. If there is any question about that gap, we just say we don't know because we don't have any document to support what happened, not in the ITS at least. So this is just uh, the first part of the email uh, to give you an idea of the level of description that we do. So we basically say, uh, describe all the documents saying attachment and followed by the attachment number, the document number, just because uh, when you say to someone who has never seen such documents, when we say the least you know, the deporta deportation list. It doesn't mean anything. If you, if you receive 50 documents, you don't know which one is which. So by the, um, the document ID, the document number, at least the person will be able to identify which document. So for, for us, it's a lot of time. You know, it's, it's really time consuming, but it's, it's really, you know, so important for the person to understand that this is the document. This is the second part of the email. The, the last part, I didn't copy it here, but the last part, we also provide people with um, other um, sources, potential uh, sources and resources that exist online and in other centers. Sometimes, you know, we, um, we stop where we are in the museum because we don't have any other resources there, but we know that there are some other resources in other countries, so we point the person to those uh, places with um, addresses or websites or something. So we, we basically, we don't stop with the museum. We also add whatever exists and that we know. Um, we also search for survivors seeking compensation. Uh, other collections that we have at the museum. We cannot search for every single person, but for survivors seeking compensation, you can imagine that they need every single document to prove that they were in a ghetto or in a camp. It depends on the, the, the compensation programs that they are applying for. So um, because we have millions and millions of documents at the museum, we also have a lot of documents that have lists of people uh, in different um, resources and countries. We cannot <coughs> in-house capture, index all those you know, collections because it, we, because it would take an army of indexers and a lot of time. So we partnered with Ancestry.com uh, and Ancestry uh, finds people who index for us and then we bring back into our own database all the, the names that have been indexed um, and this is the way that we can search them. So we bring them back into what we call the HSV, that stands for Holocaust Survivors and Victims Database. So all the names that have been captured from different sources and different collections in the museum, we bring them into the database so you know, it's easier after this because we just, somehow, I'm simplifying it, but we type the name of the person and we might be able to find another collection that has the name there, um, and it's, it's a different collection, and we can, uh, sometimes it's, it's, um, the collection is digitized, so it takes only a few minutes to find it, to find the page with the name of the person, so it's just complementary to the ITS. This is really, um, uh, it, it's something that is, invaluable for survivors seeking compensation. Sometimes, you know, it's the only document that allows them to get compensation. And those are examples of other collections that we have at the museum that we search uh, when it's uh, about survivors uh, seeking compensation. So, for example, we have the registration form for the Krakow Judenrat. Um, and those, uh, on those forms, there are sometimes pictures. Uh, so this is also very moving because that could be the, on, the last picture taken uh, of uh, a person that we sent to um, the family today. We also have the Lodge Ghetto Worker Card, uh, and again, those cards have sometimes, most of the times, they have uh, photographs and also the, uh, uh, the uh, signature of the person. So what we do, um, we really help people every day. I mean, you know, when, when 
Um, when I describe the work that we do, I like to say that we are almost like social workers somehow uh, because we help people. And uh, it's, it's really so rewarding when you go home and you, you know that you have helped someone, uh, at least you know, one person during the day. And, um, and we, you know, by helping that person, we also bring closure sometimes. Um, even if the, you know, most of the time the information that we convey is not very cheerful because you know it's most of the time about people who perish during the Holocaust. But um, some some family members don't even know anything about what happened. Uh, so when we when we say, well, this is what happened to your grandparents, at least they know, and it's it's very important for them to know. Um, we also, for the 20th anniversary of the museum, um, we traveled to some uh, cities and we did on-site research. Uh, so for 10 hours during the day with my staff, we were in the room and by 30 minute appointments, we actually started to do basic research in the ITS. Um, of course, you can imagine that we, can f we cannot find all the documents in 30 minutes, that would be Fantastic, but we can't. But we actually can try and know if there is something in the ITS, and if there is something, we would follow up with the person later, and we would, you know, send her or him additional information. But at least we would check the ITS. And um, you can imagine that for us, uh, we were, you know, you have the person sitting next to you, and in 30 minutes, you have to pull out information and basic information, and you have to say, okay, well, tell me the name of the person that you're looking for. What happened? What do you know? And um, and we somehow absorbed all those stories. You know, by you know, every 30 minutes we had really many many stories that we absorbed like sponges. Um, and it was very emotional, but also so fantastic to be able to have that experience because you know when you search the ITS and you're in front of your computer. You don't talk to anyone. I mean, you're in front of the computer, you send the document by email, but you, know, you don't have the interaction with people. So you know, when you do on-site research, you have the immediate reaction of the person seated next to you, and the person is looking at the computer at the same time. So that person discovers the documents on, you know, uh, at the same time as you. And so um, I'm just gonna share with you some of the stories that happened uh, to us during the 20th anniversary. So that, um, that gentleman actually um, came to, it was in Washington, D.C. Uh, he came with his son and uh, he sat down and he explained to me that he was 16 when he, um, he came to the United States by himself. His father remained in Poland and his mother was at, by, um, back then she was, in, um, she was in Palestine. And um, so he came here by himself and uh, he, um, he joined the U.S. Army, and he went back to Europe to fight against uh, the Nazis and against Germany, and against the Germans. So first he came and he asked me about, you know, his father. So I found some documents about his father, who was in Buchenwald, and then he started to tell me the whole story. Um, and he said, well, you know, I was with Eisenhower, and I liberated some camps, and I ended up being a translator at the Nuremberg trial. And you can imagine, I mean, I was crying, actually, because it, it was so emotional when he started to say that, and he, and, um, he didn't really tell the whole story even to his son and, and daughter. Uh, and his son is the gentleman next to him, and so his son and, and myself who were just crying, and he was, you know, it's, it's hard not to cry sometimes. I mean, you don't want to, but, um, but then um, he ended up giving all the documents that he has uh, to the museum because he said, well, my son doesn't want to keep this because he thinks that it's very important for, you know, everybody to see those documents, and my daughter thinks the same way. So he ended up giving everything to the museum, and we found documents about his father. Uh, oops. Um, what you're seeing here um, on the, um, the upper left corner is exactly what I described. So the researcher would, you know, would perform research with the person next to her, um, in that case, Lucy, my colleague. And, um, and so they would discover the names and they would sometimes recognize them before you because you cannot recognize the name. You can just you know, make sure that this is the right name based on the information that you've been given. But um, then you can see the reaction uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, on, the left, on the left side, um, that person said, oh my God. And this is the expression that we heard the most, oh my God, because basically they discovered this, and it's, oh my God, this is, this is my, you know, my grandfather, oh my God, this is my mother. This. 
And um, so we took pictures of those people, um, and on the upper right corner, uh, she was the third generation, and she was so amazed at the, you know, what we found for her grandfather that she wanted to volunteer at the museum and to help the museum. Um, so it's, it's really amazing stories because um, I always say that when we look at the ITS collection, we don't look at archival material, we look at people's you know, stories. Uh, because we reconstruct the story behind the documents. I mean, we use the documents to understand what happened to them, so we don't, you know, we don't look at those things as just archival material, papers, or something. This is about people, this is about individuals. This, um, this gentleman on the left um, was absolutely amazing. He was, that was in New York, um, and uh, the whole morning, I had people sitting next to me 30 minutes after 30 minutes, most of them were from Hungary. Uh, we don't have much information about Hungarian Jews because, as you know, they were deported at the very end, and so there is very little in the ITS about them. So most of the morning, I couldn't find much in the ITS, and it's really frustrating because you feel the disappointment of the person next to you when the person, you know, uh, expects so much about the ITS because ITS is almost the last chance to find something. And it was at the end of the morning, and that gentleman sat next to me, and I, so I asked him the basic question, and I said, okay, well, where, um, uh, where was your family? And he said, Hungary. And I was thinking, oh my God, another one that I'm gonna disappoint. And it's really difficult to disappoint someone you know, next to you. And uh, of course, I didn't show anything, but I was hoping that I would find something. And sure enough, he said, well, my, um, with my, my parents, we uh, ended up in a DP camp. And I said, okay, well, let's, let's try this. Um, so I found his father in a DP camp, and then he said, um, oh, but that's, that's interesting, that's the DP camp where I was born. And so I said, well, I, I'm gonna ask you a very indiscreet question, but can you give me your date of birth? And he said, yes, so I looked him up, and, um, and I found the document that he's holding, actually, that is his registration card in the DP camp. And he wanted to be taken in picture because he said, well, this is my birth certificate. And I said, well, not exactly. It's not exactly your birth certificate, but it is like your birth certificate because he didn't have one. And um, that's his, his registration card in the DP camp. He was born in 1940, um, 1946. And, um, and he, was, uh, he was there with his wife, and he was very, very shy. And you know, the only thing he said was, you don't see any tears, but they are inside. Um, so, you know, all those moments are just, you know, um, inside us now. Uh, it's, it's really amazing that all those stories that we've heard uh, during that, um, the 20th anniversary. That person, uh, she found documents about her parents and that was her um, daughter and niece, I believe, uh, and they were so happy for her to find something. So you can see we were just, you know, the room, this is at the museum, that was uh, in Washington DC, the room was, you know, packed with people. And those photographs um, are about um, not only survivors, but also liberators, because we had a lot of liberators invited during that event, uh, and somehow they met. Uh, and it was absolutely fantastic to capture those moments, because some of the survivors, you know, met liberators of the camp where they were. And of course, they didn't remember each other because they couldn't remember anything, but that, would, that meant something to say, well, you know, I liberated your camp, and the other one would say, oh my gosh, you know. And um, so that was very emotional for some of them. And on the um, upper right, uh, upper left corner of that slide, uh, this gentleman was from Canada, and um, it was very, very, it was very funny. I have to say, this was uh, in Washington D.C., and he wanted, he knew that Bill Clinton was uh, invited, and he wanted to meet with Bill Clinton. And you can imagine, I mean, um, the security and the, you know. Uh, to meet Bill Clinton, that's not very easy, but um, somehow the museum staff managed for him to meet with Bill Clinton, so he was really, really happy um, that he was able to do it. Um, that gentleman was um, a veteran and a liberator, and some of them came wearing uh, their uniforms, so they were very proud to wear their uniforms. Um, so this is the picture of the, the same gentleman who eventually, who made it, and he, he made actually Bill Clinton. <laughs> oh. 
Um, that was in Los Angeles uh, at the bottom of the slide. And it's mostly um, all the flags of the unit uh, that liberated the camp. And uh, now I want to share with you, and I'm going to um, stop talking, uh, I'm going to share with you some of those what we call thank you notes that we receive. Um, when I say that it's really a, a, an honor to work and to help people, it's really the most the, the, the best reward that we can have is to receive that you know those thank you notes uh, because we know that we help people and we help someone bringing closure or, or you know at least getting information to those people and um, so those thank you notes are the best reward ever and I usually uh, share them with most of the staff at the museum because this is not only us it's, this is also what the museum does you know this reflects what I mean the service that we provide uh, and we are um, walking the extra miles, you know, in most cases to help people and to find whatever we can find, especially when we don't find anything in the ITS. This is the worst thing ever for us to send a negative response to someone. So we try to provide people with anything that we can find. So I'm just going to share with you those notes. And this is the um, staff in the division I work in. So um, we're, we have two branches in our division, the research and reference branch, which includes the ITS, and the data management branch, which is um, m mostly the technical staff that make sure that we uh, enter all those names in our databases to make, it, to make that searchable. So that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. No, we don't have, no. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, no, there is no documentation from uh, Russia, really. However, we do have, I'm sorry, we do have documentation um, uh, from the Russian zone of occupation in the ITS. Well, I the help yes, I, I understand. I understand. I, so the answer is no, but we do have something about the Russian zone. But, but what I wanted to ask was when you mentioned power, the likelihood of getting information to someone, say, from Western Europe who was sent to Eastern Europe is much better than the other way around. So I, I think of uh, just, you know, hypothetically, two names. <laughs> um, Herschel Grinspan is very famous, you know, and, and his parents were deported back to uh, uh, Poland. That, that's number one. Number two, in the book by Shira, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, he mentions, just in passing, he mentions a man with the last name Leiba, L-E-Y-B-A, whom he describes as the 75-year-old consul of Paraguay in Paris. Now, if I wanted to find out whatever happened to Leiba, what happened to uh, Grinspan's parents, uh, because they were from Western Europe, is there a chance? I I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tax the resources to ask that. But I'm just asking, would they probably have some information at the International Tracing Service about those people? Uh, we do have information about Herschel Grinspan in the in the ITS. Uh, we do. Uh, I never searched his parents, um, but I, I'm happy to do it. Um, I would say it's. I cannot answer the question by yes or no uh, because it's always worth trying in you know the ITS first because the you know the first level of research takes 15 minutes uh, so it's not a, it's not 
too time consuming, so you can know right away whether there is something in the ITS or there is nothing in the ITS. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, some colleagues come to us and they would say, well, I have this and, you know, it, I don't think that I have this name and I, you know, from what I know from the ITS about the ITS, I don't think there is going to be anything in the ITS. Well, sometimes there is something in the ITS because um, there are so many sources um, that were, you know, collected and so basically it's worth checking. So if you want to know something, if you want to know what happened to Herschel Grinspan's parents, um, you know, you can email me uh, directly. I'm not going to get back to you very quickly because this is not our top priority. You're welcome to come to the museum if you, you know, ever come to DC and if you want to do this type of research. Um, but I would say it's worth trying. Well, what about when I mentioned this name of a 75-year-old Jewish consul from Paraguay in Paris? I, I, I think he was arrested. And his last name was Liber. I wouldn't... He doesn't really have much reason to be in the ITS, but again, depending on what happened to him, he might be mentioned in the ITS. Again, it's really, you know, I can really answer it by yes or no. Um, it's just worth trying. Yes? I was curious about spelling of names, because in my case, I only know the names in Yiddish. I don't know how, what it would be translated that's a great question. Uh, that's it's an amazing question because um, we are used to so many different spellings. So uh, everything is phonetical. Uh, the ITS um, system database, if you will, um, contains what we call a sound index. So it means that no matter how you enter the name into the database, um, it will come up with some different options. So you know you, you can enter the German spelling. Uh, it would come up also with the Russian spelling, the Polish spelling. So you would you know you would try everything until you find something, if there is anything in the ITS. But um, just to give you a concrete example, um, I had to search a name, uh, a Russian name, and uh, it was in a particular collection that no one usually searches. I searched it only once, and I'm probably the only one who searched it. Um, this collection has, if you think about the history of the ITS, um, no logic um, about the fact that it is in the ITS. The collection is about um, ru people who were in, um, from Russia at the end of the 19th century, the very end of the 19th century, and they ended up in Harbin. And just because those people, Jews and non-Jews, um, were hired to build the Trans-Siberian. So I find them in the ITS in a collection that is about um, immigrant, I mean, uh, refugees, um, people applying for the refugee status. They are in China in the 1950s and 1960s. So ITS is really not only about 1933 to 1945 and the immediate post-war. It also goes further than this. And so those people applied to, I mean, apply for immigration. They want to get out of China. Most of them want to go to Australia. Um, I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so I had to search that collection because the great-grandfather of a person uh, was in that situation. And he gave me so many different Russian spelling, and I don't speak Russian, but the person who was next to me spoke Russian, and, um, and I couldn't find anything. I tried all the different spellings I could think of, and suddenly I said, okay, would you pronounce his name? And he said, he pronounced it, and I said, oh wow, well there are at least three or four more spellings that I can come up with. And sure enough, I found it. Uh, so everything is phonetical, so if you pronounce your name in Yiddish, I would come up with different spellings, and in any case, if there is any reason for your name to be in the ITS, we'll find it. As you're talking, you could anglicize, I mean, uh, the name, uh, you know, what it would be Yiddish sounding when you say it. So if that's going to be a benefit. We're so used to this, we don't even think of. Um, you know, uh, we, we really think phonetical. So this is the only way. You, you just pronounce something and we will, you know, try everything. Last thing we have no problem with is the first thing. We'll try. <laughs> yes? Uh, my uh, mother-in-law's uh, father and sister-in-law 
professional uh, sister in just a home home. And I know that Triplink was a death camp. Were there ever any lists for Triplink at all? No. I have no idea. I, you know, a few years ago, I, I asked the Red Cross to do some searching about our so there was nothing about that. Um, so it means that there would be a trace of your previous inquiry. That would, that's exactly what we would find. Um, it, you know, you can try again, uh, but it, there is nothing new per se. So um, it's just a different way of searching now because it's digitized, I mean, for us. Um, but um, if you want, I mean, I can try to do the research again, but I, I, you know, the worst case scenario is that I don't find anything, but I will find a trace of your previous inquiry. You have letters, believe it or not, the mail, you probably know this mail is still being delivered, and, uh, but it was hard for them to get mail to the West, and it's tough, but finally, it is. I, I just want to ask you one other thing, and this is from my parents' side. My maternal family is from Belarus, my maternal from Southeast Ukraine, near uh, Donetsk, who were the Jewish agricultural colonies in Southeast Ukraine. But I take it that there is really nothing that can be found. Don't take that as a statement. No, um, let's try. <laughs> let's try. I mean, I brought some forms, so let's try. Yeah, uh, okay, then, and then you. Um, that was a fascinating presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. It really shows us the whole field. Um, I have a couple specific kind of questions. Number one, you were mentioning so for Pol you mentioned labor camps, for instance. So do you have documentation from Pol labor camps that were sort of in the various stages of Poland, or mostly the ones that were in Germany only? Like, did they bring documents back with them? I mean, how would they end up? Like, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, for instance, was in Skarżysko, Kamiana. So it was you know, far out in Poland, but did, did any of those documents, if the Soviet Union wasn't sharing, their resources, would that would those kind of labor camps in Poland and Ukraine have made it into the archives? I'm not sure, to be honest, because this is not the way we search. Uh, so, because we don't search by camps, uh, but I could try. Um, I mean, I could try with her name, I mean, the name, um, and I could try, we, we can also search the ITS by keywords, by the way. I mean, researchers search by keywords. By any type of keyword you can think of. Uh, it's, it's like Google, but you don't get the same results as Google. Uh, but you just enter any type of keyword that you can think of. Um, you just have to start either from you know, the very narrow one and then you broaden your search or the opposite. Um, so the thing with keywords is um, because the ITS is not only in 20 different, uh, 27 different languages, but also alphabet, and most of the ITS documents are um, handwritten. So you cannot OCR the ITS. I mean, you can OCR only, I mean, you know, this is the recognition, uh, the um, computer type recognition of uh, letters uh, and characters. So if you, uh, you can capture everything just by computer and the, the computer will capture the names or the location, whatever. So this is just a um, systematic and automatic program. You cannot really use this for the ITS when it's handwritten. Uh, you can use this only when it's, um, the documentations that were the documentation that was typed, uh, like reports, like testimonies that were actually captured and transcripted, um, but it's worth trying. Uh, you can try to see. I mean, you can send me the name of the the name of the camp, and I can try to see if we, if we have it. Um, but so we should go with the yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Would the the tracing service have the names of, for example, uh, there was a famous German profiteer and industrialist whose name was Walter Turbins, T-O-E-B-B-E-N-S. And I wanted to know what happened to him. As a matter of fact, I, I got an answer. We don't know really <laughs> what happened to him. Is it, for, I got it from the, uh, the museum. Is it reasonable to assume that when the museum sends you an answer, that they might have also asked the ITS if, if ITS has any information on this? We don't need to ask the ITS because we have the same collection. So we don't need to ask 
bad aerosol in Germany. Uh, if you received a, a negative answer from the museum, it means that we have exhausted all the possibilities in the ITS collection. So it means that we, that's we don't, that it means that we don't have anything about him. You would have in the collection <coughs> indirectly names of, uh, of uh, Nazis, right? Uh, we not, I mean, we do have uh, other collections at the museum that you're welcome to search. Um, and we have, in those collections, we have perpetrators, we have Nazis, we have collaborators, uh, but this is not what my division does. Uh, we help survivors and the families of survivors and the families of victims. We usually don't, no, I don't have staff to search for very broad questions like this, and especially about Nazis or perpetrators. Um, so if you, if you have received this answer, it means that we didn't find anything in the ITS. Yes? Are there any fashion of, this, of the Hungarian transports? Uh, it's, um, I don't know. Uh, I would say if you have names, uh, we can check. Uh, we don't search by category. In general, you're not certain whether they kept lists of, of those passengers? You're thinking of? Well, in certain countries, like. France You're talking about deportation lists. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Um, for we don't have much about people who were deported from Hungary, but depending on what happened to them, we might have something in the ITS. This is not the stronger collection, the strongest collection that we have. Um, but we sometimes we do find them in the ITS, so it's it's really worth checking if you have names. We wouldn't find um, if you're looking for a complete list of a specific transport, for example. That's going to be a little bit more difficult to search unless um, you have a name and we identify a person on that transport, and then we can go back from that name. We can go back to the whole list. Would there have been a list like that? Contemporary, the contemporary time has been lost since then, or there just never was that kind of bookkeeping kept? I, I have to say I'm not sure they had lists of transport. Um, they were, I mean, I know that there are lists of Jews in Hungary and especially in Budapest, so there is a, like a Jewish file. Uh, but this is not in the ITS. This is outside the ITS archives. I'm not sure we have transport list for the Jews in Hungary. Um, I'm not sure. If I'm not mistaken, there were lists for France. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. But you're talking about the very end of the war. I mean, you're talking about 1944, uh, when all the Jew I mean, most of the Jews in, in Budapest and in Hungary were rounded up and, and you know, uh, deported. Uh, that was a very, very fast action. So, uh, unless, I mean, unlike France and, and, um, and Belgium and Holland, uh, where the deportation started, especially, I mean, in 1942 up to the end of the war. So, it was a longer period of time, and there, we have those lists. For the Jews in Hungary, I'm not sure we do. I'm not sure there were some lists like this um, in, I mean, in the ITS. It's interesting because all the transports for... I'm not a Hungarian expert, so anything about France, I can answer it. About Hungary, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. well, because I think all the transports were done under a particular division of the whatever the name of that office was, uh, Eichmann's office. So um, they did it in different countries, and they were very efficient in doing that. Why, well, I'm wondering if these lists did it. Again, um, if you have names, um, I can try to search for those names, but um, I wouldn't start searching for a list of people deported. Um, I mean, it's, it's possible. We've done this type of research, but it's easier to find, to start with a name and to go back from the name to the whole list. Yes. I just want to say this was absolutely fascinating. Okay. And I'm, I'm very impressed with the devotion and the dedication that somebody 
you know, unfortunately, we don't have much of that nowadays in, in professions and jobs. I was very, very impressed with it. Thank, Thank you. you. This was great. Thank you. I'm very fortunate because. Um, I have to say I'm very fortunate because my staff is so dedicated. I mean, um, it's amazing that the, they're, the worst case scenario for them is really when they don't find anything. I mean, this is the worst thing. That's depression, but on the other end, there's so much uh, reward when you do find something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right, please join me once again. Thank you. And we do have a reception halfway down the hall, so please join us and our speaker. Thank you all. Happy Hanukkah.